Hey everybody, welcome back to the ECG of the day. My name is Reed, and down in the description there's a link to the PDF of today's ECG so that you can follow along and make your own notes. And if you would like uh, to see more of these videos, feel free to subscribe to the channel and like this video to help uh, get people to see the video and enjoy ECG. So let's jump into this one. And so the first thing I like to do is look at the forest, get an idea of what's going on in the trees of the forest from my QRS. So maybe down here in lead two, I see I've got what appears to be, I would say, a narrow complex rhythm that is just kind of beating along at a pretty regular rate and rhythm, or at least regular rhythm, and that continues throughout the entirety of the strip. If I want to get kind of an average rate here, maybe I'll choose this R wave that ends on a solid line, and we'll go to this one, and we'll say 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50, so maybe we'll call this just over 50, maybe 53 beats per minute, and so we've got a bradycardia. We know our differential for a narrow complex bradycardia is, or it could be a junctional rhythm, it could be a sinus bradycardia, it could be ectopic atrial bradycardia. All right, and I notice here as I just look through that we have P waves before my QRSs, and let's evaluate those P waves. Let's evaluate what the atria, how it's depolarizing. My P waves, if I scan up here, my P waves are upright in lead one. You can see just it's a little bit of artifact in, in lead one, but you can see an upright deflection in lead one. And then you can also see an upright P wave here in AVF that tells me that my atrial depolarization is occurring in the down and to the left direction, which is normal for sinus node. So this is a sinus P wave. And so now I'm going to see does every P wave conduct to every QRS? And in what fashion does it do that, right? And so that's by looking at the PR interval. So we can see that my PR interval right here, it looks like it's about maybe four small boxes. And so my PR interval is 160 milliseconds, which is normal, right? Normal is 120 to 200. And I scan throughout the rhythm just to make sure that all of my PR intervals look the same. And I see that they do. And I look throughout, I see that they all do. And then I also look for any P waves that don't have QRSs. And so maybe I'll look on the T waves of the previous beats. I don't see any P waves that are not conducting. So we have good normal AV function, where every P is conducted to a QRS with a PR interval that is appropriate. Next thing I'm going to do is evaluate my QRS complex. We said it was right on the border of narrow. I would say if I measured the width here, it looks to be about two and a half small boxes maybe. So my QRS duration seems to be maybe 100 milliseconds, which is normal. My QRS, as you can see, is negative in lead one in what appears to be about isoelectric in AVF. So what does that mean? If it's isoelectric in AVF, that means if AVF is right here, that means that it's perpendicular. My QRS axis is perpendicular to that if it's isoelectric. And then the fact that it's negative in lead one tells me it's going away from lead one, so my axis is deviated to the right. Right, so this is right axis, axis deviation. Right, that's 180 degrees. And so what are our causes of right axis deviation? Well, the first thing that should come to your mind is right ventricular hypertrophy. Right, if this ventricle, this right ventricle, was big and strong in a bad way, if it was too big and strong, it's going to pull signal to the right. And so I look in V1, which is my lead that mainly captures the right ventricle, and I see I've got these really tall R waves, right? These really tall R waves. In the amplitude of the R wave, if I draw my baseline, which is right here, and I see the top of the R wave is right here, that is, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 millimeters amplitude. And we know that if the R is greater than seven millimeters in amplitude in these right ventricular leads, V1, that is criteria for right ventricular hypertrophy. Right ventricular 
hypertrophy. And that makes sense, right? If we look at our transverse diagram of, of our precordial leads, you can see that my right ventricle, which is all this muscle right here, depolarization towards that muscle is mainly captured by this V1 lead and a little bit by V2, but more so V1. And so that's where we can measure if my right ventricle is hypertrophied. That's what we do, and that's what we have. So that explains our right axis deviation. Now let's look at our QT interval. You can see my QT seems to be pretty normal here. If I take my R to R interval, kind of right down the middle, my T wave should be finished by then, and you see that that does appear to be the case. So I have a normal QT interval. And then I'm going to scan for pathological Q waves and S tier T wave changes throughout. And I don't see any Q waves. You're going to see some repolarization abnormalities due to the ventricular hypertrophy, but Nothing that is elevated or depressed that makes me concerned for any ischemic changes in any anatomical distribution. And so when we put this together, what do we have? We've got a sinus rhythm, specifically a sinus bradycardia at a rate of 53 beats per minute with right ventricular hypertrophy causing right axis deviation. And so when you see somebody that has right ventricular hypertrophy, you might ask yourself, why? What would cause your right ventricle to grow a lot of muscle and hypertrophy? Well, remember that the right ventricle pumps where? It pumps blood to the lungs, right? And so it does so via the pulmonary arteries. And if your pulmonary arteries, if you have pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is high pressure in your pulmonary arterial system, then your right ventricle is having to pump against a really high resistance. And over time, it's going to remodel and get a lot stronger. Well, what diseases cause pulmonary arterial hypertension? You think of a lot of lung disease, right? So cystic fibrosis, COPD, even um, not lung, but cardiac causes could be left sided heart failure, right? Because if the left side is failing, that all of that blood is going to back up and congest the pulmonary system. And so you think of RVH as seen in these people, right? That chronic smokers, um, chronic people with cystic fibrosis, um, other types of lung disease. And so, um, yeah, I think correlating this clinically is really important. And so, um, yeah, I hope this helps, and if you have any questions about the CCG, feel free to throw them into the comments below, and if not, we will see you on the next CCG of the day. Take care.